How's it going, everybody? Welcome into yet another episode of Debate Night. We've got more awesome topics, a new cast of analysts. Well, a new cast of old analysts. Um, you know, no, no new faces, some familiar ones today, but some great ones at that. And uh, should be a great show. So we're going to start by introducing everybody we got today. Brody Smith is in the house. Yeah, before we jump into it, we need to come up with some sort of like... Um algorithm or statistics of like has this group ever done a show together like have these yeah. four people ever done just so we know if it's a brand new show or not well there's um, an easy way to do this uh, jake have you ever gone on with gary don't believe so okay there show. we go new, new show. show new show new there show. we go <laughs> um, so yeah man of the people went back read the comments it is uh it's i'm liking where disc golf is heading right I think we've been in this la la, everyone hold each other's hands. Everyone say how good everyone is. If I have to be the one to have people shoot bow and arrows at me to get people riled up and actually be a sports fan, I'll, I'll be it. What is it? I'll be the martyr. Is that what people say? Sure. Um, some people in there saying this show's awful. Get Brody off top comment saying this show would suck if Brody wasn't on it. It's tough. It's tough to kind of go back and forth. Um, kind of like the lightsaber. And we talked a little bit before the show too. I just asked the question, should pros be, a, be allowed to play in uh, a tiers or local events? And I had people just like coming after me and it's like, How dare I you? guess we can't ask questions anymore, but yeah, this, I, this is what I want to see. This is what sports is all about. Fandom people getting riled up about topics that at the end of the day don't matter. He's going to, if Brody leaves anything on this sport, it's going to be, he's going to get people angry. Uh, speaking of man of the people, <laughs> Silas, throw up that, throw up that graphic for us. Oh yeah. We've got a shirt. <laughs> we've got a oh, shirt. Oh baby. If, uh, if you want to <laughs> check out the man of the people, yes. shirt, you can go to foundation right now and it's on the site. So make sure to check it out, man. Of yes. the people. <laughs> so it is out there. We will make merch. If it happens, there will be merch. That's the rule of foundation. <laughs> Love that. Um, Hunter is back. I'm back, baby. I'm back. I don't know how long it's been. I think it's been like two weeks or so. Yeah. Uh, so I don't really know what's been going on, but uh, I'm here to restore uh, order from chaos. So okay, here I am. Good luck with that. Uh, Gary is also back after a week off the show. You know, I noticed that last week when Brody was reading on the, the top comments, he failed to mention the uh, second most liked comment. You know, man of the people, I want to be here to tell you guys. No one remembers I about second, Gary. No one remembers second, Gary. No one remembers second. I appreciate everyone uh, feeling the love with the Mount Rushmore, hashtag COVID Rushmore, hashtag debate gate. I hear you. <laughs> Gary, Gary's what's wrong with this world. Gary's what's wrong with this world. Giving handouts, giving – you're, you're giving those like medals. You got 18th in mm -hmm. your local swim meet, and you go home with a ribbon. <laughs> you get hear. nothing, Gary, for second. I, you get nothing. There's I didn't not even that many lanes in a comment. pool. I didn't hear you mention the top comment. No love for Yuli out there. Uh, yeah, oh. Yuli, uh, shout out to Yuli. We need to get Yuli Big on news. the show, actually. We actually do need to get Yuli on the show. Okay. That is okay. that is facts. Maybe next week. We'll see. Uh, and then Jake is also here. Yeah, I'm back again. Last time I was on, it was a bit of a bloodbath with Dustin Rich and Brody. That was the whole lightsaber topic. <laughs> I don't think it's going to calm down this week, but I'm ready for I'm ready for the worst of it. All right. All right. Well, hopefully we can get, you know, get riled up. I think there's some provocative topics, I'll say. Uh, we're going to start with the first one. This one, maybe not super provo provocative, but it, it'll be interesting. Um, first topic here. So while the Pro Tour moved to Europe, many of the stars headed to Nevada to play the Las Vegas Challenge. Historically, the first Pro Tour of the year that was removed this season. Should the LVC be back on the schedule next year? And what event should it replace if the European events are off limits? So if you not including those, because I think that would be an easy sub for some people. Uh, or on the flip side, was the event not built to remain on tour long term? You know, was this something that was going to happen eventually? Anyways, Brody, what are your thoughts? I feel like there was some weird stuff going on, and that's why the tour left. I want to say they were trying to make it to where... We were playing only one course or something, and the people at Innova and the people there didn't want it. Or I, I feel like there was weird stuff happening that prohibited, that really forced the tour not to go back there or made the tour decide to not go back there. I don't think it was a, a hey, we don't want to have an event in Las Vegas. It was more so this is only really the, and it is. If you've been out to Las Vegas, there really is not another course that you could have an event at. So, 
there was something there that basically made the pro tour not be out there. I'm not surprised that there's a bunch of pros that went out there. I even kind of thought about maybe going out there as well. Um, granted, we did have my brother-in-law shout out Texas A&M super weird college, very cultish, very weird beside the topic though. Congratulations for him for graduating. Um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, Las Vegas challenge. I mean, it's a big event. A lot of people like that course. So I'm not surprised to see people go out there. I think what, I mean, I, I like them going back there if they can figure it out because it makes sense on our way out to the West coast versus having this big gap in between the two uh, players have to drive out there anyways. Um, so it would be nice to have somewhere along the way to pit stop over there. And, uh, yeah, we'll kind of see what ends up happening with the, uh, European side. You don't think, uh, Piccoli ranch would be a good spot. Oh, I, I bet <laughs> there would be some people listening to this podcast would love a tournament out there. Piccoli ranch. <laughs> All houses are in play. Uh, so Hunter, many pedestrians hit. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Hunter, what are your thoughts on the uh, wild horse situation? Yeah. I mean, I, I think what Brody's saying makes sense. There's gotta be some type of reason other than just the schedule for it not to be on tour. Cause I think it should be back on tour. Um, personally, I think the schedule should just be reworked so that the Europe events are like in a stretch where players who want to go to Europe can just go and play more of a Europe swing in their schedule. Instead of just like you go over there, you come back, you go over, you come back and like this possible splitting of a field that we luckily didn't really see happen, but it could happen in the future. Um, and I don't really think an event needs to disappear for LVC to be added. I think if you just rework the schedule, you could just fit it right in. I mean, the timeline that happened this weekend would make sense. And the Copenhagen Open, I think, it should be the one that gets moved. If there's one that does have to be removed, if that's what we're playing this game of like one in, one out, my opinion would suggest one of the ones that were in Texas, where we spent like a whole month in Texas. Um, most likely, I think the Open at Austin would be the one that makes the most sense simply because it has the least amount of event history. But I think all of the Texas events just kind of got boring. We were in Texas for a long time. So I think one of those would be the easiest to swap. But realistically, I don't think there's that many Pro Tour events that we can't fit another one. And with the move from the Midwest to the West and kind of how this whole early schedules work, I think LVC fits perfectly there. But most likely, it's like Brody said, where there's some type of outside factor that's the actual reason this thing isn't on tour. Hey, maybe to spice up the Texas events, we just need to go to College Station, right, Brody? Getting your text no, A&M. No, dude. They, they everyone says howdy down there. It's very <laughs> um it's very Chick-fil-A-ish, which is fine when I get waffle fries, but I don't want to see that every single time. <laughs> that's an all that's all time quote right there. Um, all right, Gary, what do you think about the uh the Vegas event? <laughs> I'll touch on this a bit more later, but we need to put a lot more respect on these European events. Um when it comes to Vegas, I think it creates a, another style of of golf that belongs on the tour when you think about the the golf course style courses vegas kind of stands out on its own a little bit if you look at like the climate they have to deal with and the topography it's different than a lot of other you know ball golf courses uh, assuming that chess.com is going to stay where it's at i agree with hunter that one of the texas events could be dropped for this the only issue with that is that demographically texas can handle three events with the number of disc golf players and courses that are there I think logistically it's, it's problematic too because you would require players to probably go backwards uh, somewhere and that's not really going to work for a lot of those that are grinding on the tour. Um, a good spot would be right after Emporia because like Brady said, they're already on their way out to Stockton for OTB. And in fact, Stockton is only about eight hours of driving from Vegas. So it's a, it's a, they can do that for sure. Um, if we were to move, if we can't move the European events, then I think one way of looking at it is maybe one of the Oregon events has to get moved or maybe one of the Oregon events would have to go. Personally, I don't want it to be the Portland Open because I think Glendevere is just this beautiful course and it's absolutely incredible to play at. Um, and, but the Beaver State Fling is also difficult there because there's a lot of love for Milo and um, it, it breaks up the style of golf being played on the tour. So it's important to have that there as well. My recommendation, you know, if anyone cares about it, is that we add an extra weekend onto the year and we squeeze it in because that's important. As for longevity, I think the courses there are solid. I think the atmosphere and the accommodations are great based upon what I've heard people say about it. But I think they need to work on the coverage and make it a bit more entertaining since most of the course looks like the same 80% of the time. Yeah, tough to sometimes tough to broadcast that. And definitely getting rid of Milo. I mean, Hunter loves Milo. It's Milo is like one of Hunter's favorite courses, right, Hunter? Fun course. Do the same shot 18 times off the tee, but it's a fun course. <laughs> um, all right, Jake, round it up for us. Uh, what do you think about this whole Vegas situation? Yeah, and, and Brody was the only one that really touched on this. And then, Gary, I'm surprised you said demographically Texas can handle it because let's look at the map of where all the pro tour, pro tour stops are. I'm a Southern California guy. 
do you know how far I have to drive if I want to go see a pro tour event? Even if I was going to Las Vegas, that's a six hour drive. But you just said Stockton's another eight hours from Las Vegas. You know, there's kind of a black hole in Southern California, Nevada, Arizona, like the whole area of pro tour stops and Texas having three, Oregon having two. I think there's a lot of room for flexibility there. Um, I am more on board with the idea that we change up the schedule towards the beginning where all-star weekend is in Florida. Um, I think we can push that even a week earlier. I think Florida weather can accommodate that. That's why we have it there in the first place and just add the extra weekend into the year. I'm kind of tired being in Southern California and not being able to see the pros come into town. It used to be a challenge at Goat Hill, but now that's a pretty minor event. So my recommendation is to just add an extra weekend, much like what Gary said, but I just don't want these, these, uh, Southern Californians that I'm playing with every day to, to miss out on the pro tour as well. I miss it. It's definitely, I mean, it's very interesting what's happened in disc golf with the pro tour. Now, I feel like there used to be a lot of competitive disc golf on the West coast. Um, pretty big scene, especially when players kind of stuck to their local areas. I mean, our sport literally came from Southern California and the tour doesn't, doesn't sniff it really at this point, like you mentioned. And that is, uh, certainly an interesting dynamic and it's, it's not like it's, obligated to do so but i think there are probably a lot of people in that area that would like to watch disc golf if they can find say, the right uh, spot i will say rich has i don't know if it's ruined in a good or bad way this show for me because when jake said let's look at a map i was just waiting for his background to change. <laughs> i also it expected a map to appear. i was like oh dang it is yeah. can't change his background I, I don't know how to do that do i have to get a whiteboard <laughs> and just draw some things out i, I don't know how to Maybe, do that i don't know I might have to I might have to put the the green screen like uh handcuffs on Rich one of these times. Just it's mm, like yeah, uh, you have the uh what's his know, name? Could MJ name do without Pippin? No notes and then Rich no green screen. <laughs> yeah. Just, just like everybody who happen. has a vice on this show, I bring them all in and they can't use it. It's just I, have happen. I have to whisper. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> no, Brody gets I can't Brody gets no rebuttals. Rich gets no green screen. Dustin yeah. and whatever his name is, no notes. I can't remember his name for the life of me. Jack. 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 Just go Jack, back Jack. to the comments. They only say it a couple times. There you go. You know, okay. I didn't even mention this, Brody, on the sign-up sheet. Jack put himself on on the sign-up sheet twice. It was Jack with notes and Jack without notes. He okay, put him on there twice. Okay, I don't, so I don't know which one to pick because it's funny either way at this point. That's like, actually good. <laughs> yeah. That's actually I like that he's leaning into it. So we'll you we'll just, see what happens. Might have to bring him on. You just got to surprise everyone uh, and surprise Rich by doing a player's pack to all uh, panelists in the future that get their own green screen. Yeah. There you go. Or need... just put both jacks on. That's what Jack I'm thinking. Jack with and Jack with notes. <laughs> That's what I'm thinking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> See how that goes. Um, all right. We're going to move on now. Uh, next topic. So recently had the Copenhagen Open, um, and it featured a par six for the FPO division on hole 18. Uh, though the game of golf has historically stuck to pars three through five, is it okay with disc golf to toy around with par six and beyond? Uh, what whole elements justify the use of more strokes to par? Hunter, what do you think? Yeah, I'm trying to find this comment um, because they corrected us on, I don't know if I'm going to be able to find it in time, but they corrected us on grip lock because essentially, from my understanding, this par six um, existed more or less because the FPO division didn't want the T pad shortened. So they wanted to play from the same T pad and the TDs were like, well, that's fine. We'll just make it a par six. And that's kind of how this came to be. Um, but my response to that is that's fine. Then this hole's just a par five and y'all chose to play it. It is what it is. Like I, I don't know. My issue with the par six, like par first off is relative, right? We all understand that. Like if you take a five on a hole and it's a par or it's a birdie, that doesn't really matter. Just your overall score changed but your real true score didn't change everyone played it the same way my issue with it is more just from the optics and the course design perspective because like this course in particular is a par 66 right hole 18 therefore makes up nine percent of the strokes of par being a par six which is just too much in my opinion because realistically now that pl that hole is playing 0.25 or i believe it was 0.25 strokes over par in the final round so most players were throwing five shots plus a putt 
on average and a little more than that on average. That's just so much golf to watch on one hole without leaving. I think that it just kind of makes the sport a lot more boring, which is why five, I think, is kind of where we should cap it. Because five, there's a chance that some players will play it in three, some in four, and you still have people in six, seven, eight. But if the average person is taking six shots on a hole, that's too much golf on one hole. And I don't think that's what we want. Yeah, definitely. Uh Definitely guaranteeing a lot more time spent on that hole in particular. Uh, Gary, what did you think about the par six? Really interesting. Not the first time we've seen a par six in a professional event. It happened in 2007 at the Pro Worlds. They had a 1,400 foot par six. And the 2010 Scandinavian Open, they had a par six that was only 75 feet longer than what we saw in Copenhagen. Um, what does the PDGA have to say about it? They actually break down a number of ways for TDs to determine the pars for their holes. So I took a look at that. One of the big ones was scoring distribution. The PDGA says that if 26% of experts, in this case the FPO division, get a five or better, it's a par five. 34% of them got a birdie or better. So by that metric, it's a par five. Uh, par by average score is another one. If the field of experts averages a 6.2 or more, it's considered a par six in the PDGA's eyes. Across three rounds, they average 6.2 on the nose. So by that measure, it's a par six. Um, par effective by whole length and foliage. This was a thousand feet or more, and it had light foliage. So it could be a five or a six, according to the PDGA. If you look at whole length, the PDGA says that if it's less than 1170 feet and it's in the FPO division, it's a par five. But pardon my reading here for just a moment. The PDGA says if one or more players of the appropriate skill level are available, whole pars can be based on their knowledge of which score they would honestly be expected to get without errors or lucky breaks. It's clear what the deciding factor here was, exactly what Hunter oh. mentioned. Um, the hole was played as a par five last year. It averaged a 7.23 for them last year in a much weaker field. The event organizers went to the FPO division and they said they didn't want the complexity of their hole diminished by having a shorter tee pad. I think no water, no dog legs, open OB, numbers show it's a par five. It's a growing pain for the tour. More professional play happens here. It's going to be a par five or it's going to get a new tee pad. Phew. I, it's crazy the the amount of things that the PDJ has written about that. Honestly, Tons. that was I almost puke. That was that was just a crazy roller coaster. And, and there's like four more ways to determine par. Oh it's gosh. insane. Holy smokes! Um, all right, Jake, what did you think about the par six? Yeah, next time we got to throw a beat over uh, Gary while he's reading <laughs> and get him a record deal as a new rapper. But anyway, um, no, I actually wanted to build on what Hunter was saying and kind of rebuttal it at the same time, which is. If you have any hole that's going to be a greater percentage of the total overall score, why not have it be hole 18 in this case, right? So I don't think I'm fully on board with the hole six or par six, excuse me, hole. If it's any other hole on the course, but if it's going to be one, it should be hole 18, um, particularly in MPO where you're seeing a lot less score separation. It comes down to the wire for a lot of players. And then even if it goes into a playoff situation, like we talked about last time on this show, it's more shots. It's more exciting. Um, and people are going to want to watch more down the stretch and make sure that someone can execute five shots, six shots instead of just, you know, a par three. Um, it's why the Island hole, um, hole 16, the last tournament, you know, they went to the aggregate because of that. So I'm fully on board with the par sixes, but I like the idea of it being hole 18, where it does count for more of your score and at the critical time coming down the stretch. Okay, I mean that's a, that's a, that's a valid point. I mean, we did talk about the aggregate playoff, like extending the uh, most dramatic time in the tournament. I mean, technically a par six on eighteen. Like I can see that point. That that does at least uh, play into that argument for sure. Uh, Brody, you've been waiting so patiently. What do you think? Uh, yeah. I mean, Gary, just that was brutal, man. That was so hard. Not not you. Like just reading every time. The more I hear from the PDGA, the more I'm just like, how much money have we given them? Like, why are we giving them so much money? I, there, already, <laughs> there already is. We took our sport, the sport of disc golf, the sport that all of us play. It's literally a sport that already exists with a club and a ball. We just now are doing it with a disc. Why are we inventing new rules on how to like come up with par? Like, that's crazy to think about. Par is literally how many shots it would take a skilled golfer or disc golfer to complete a hole. That's it. That's literally all. That's all you have to do. That's all. You don't have to come up with all this weird mumbo jumbo that you read that made absolutely no sense. Um, the par six makes no sense. Uh, also, that's what I was saying. It's like, I, I was like, I wonder, I didn't watch any coverage this week because I was doing family stuff, but I was wondering, I was like, 
did did they just play the same tee pad? Because I was like, that probably makes the most sense. And then you're like, oh yeah, the FPO didn't want to play a short. I was like, okay, well, that's stupid. That's just dumb. That's it's not the right hole length for them to play, clearly. So I don't know. This this whole thing just made me sick to my stomach hearing all that. <laughs> okay. Uh Two- Sorry, yeah, two, go ahead, Jerry. two very interesting things there, Brody, is that if you look at it, I think this whole definitely could have been played from the same tee pad by the FBO because at a thousand seventy five ish feet, the 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 what is it to? Can you there. put the can you put up the graphic again? Do we have any? Do they do they put any distance on that or no? Probably not, right? Yeah, I know MPO is like a, a enforced a very like chippy tee shot is kind mm-hmm. of what made it be a par five because like you couldn't attack much off the tee. So, yeah, so we have yeah. no idea how far that distance is off the tee though. Long, right? We have no, no. clue what that is. No. So, okay. So, but- yeah, and most of the most of the the strokes that were taken OB wise were from those second shots, not making it to the landing zone for a lot of the FPO players. Like long, they weren't able to get clear the the distance. Their tee shot wasn't putting themselves in a good position where when they tried to clear it, they just didn't have either the accuracy or the length to get across that that zone. Okay. Yeah, I mean, here's the other thing: just make a new. If you want to play the same tee, just make a basket shorter. Because, yeah. like, again, I. Some of these, these are kind of like our world maps where we look at Australia and we're like, dude, Australia is so tiny. And then you get there and you actually take a flight and you realize how big Australia is. That's kind of like the disc golf pro tour maps. Like that gap right there, the OB gap, that could either be a hundred feet or that could be 400 feet with how they do their maps. It's literally impossible to tell. So uh, hard to say, but yeah, I don't know. Par six. If we're doing lightsabers and all that, let's let's just do it. Might as well do a part <laughs> ten. Like yeah, why, yeah. why stop it? It doesn't end six? anywhere. But as and long as it's all eighteen, as long as let's it's all actually, eighteen. Let's actually subtract a stroke from your score if you hey, ace. Let's honestly, just start is, getting wacky with it. I'm calling is, the cap on par six, Hunter, just to be clear. If it's gonna <laughs> yeah, be no, any hole. Yeah. Wow, this what's wrong with par this seven, Jay? No, this is twenty five hole eighteen. Great. The one argument. Yeah, go ahead, Hunt. I was just gonna say, right? Like the whole idea of par six isn't great, but if we're going to do it, let's do it on hole 18 is like, Hey, shooting someone's not great, but if we're going to do it, let's do someone at the end of their life. Huh? <laughs> How about we just don't shoot someone. How about that? You know, let's start there. Let's, let's have the guy with oh. lightsabers be the spotter on hole 18. There we go. Right. It's gonna be any hole. And then let's well, just call as, it a silver and wrap our hands and call it a day. As much as the like par 10 thing is a joke. It's like, the, as much like people love to be like, well, why can't we have a par six? You know, like what's really the big deal? Well, at some point you do have to say like enough's enough or else people will just can like disc golfers are can be sickos, man. Those course designers would be like, let's make a 2000 foot hole and make it a par nine. Like they'll do it. They will. Mm-hmm. If you let them. So like it, sometimes it's best to just be like par fives. Those there's the also, longest ones. I, there's also a reason real quick. There's also a reason of why these holes were designed in the first place by golf. Again, the sport that disc golf has literally copied their sport. A par three is a very difficult, usually requiring you to use different irons that you don't use throughout the course to hit a green and then to have to have two putts. A par four, they can sometimes entice you to go for it for drivable par fours, but then you can get really risky or you have to hit a challenging shot off the tee and then you have to hit an approach shot and then you have two putts. Par five, same thing. You can either break it up in three shots, bink, bank, boom, two putts, or it can entice you to go for it in two and actually get an eagle. But those holes are also really tricky. They normally, if you go for it and you mess up, you can maybe take a bogey. Like these things are all designed. If we just make a crazy or, hole and it's not like, it's not even reachable in two and there's no danger. And now it's just like, we're throwing multiple shots to get it then why should we have par in the first place? Like, let's not even have 18 holes. Let's just play one hole that's 10,000 feet and let's see where the chips play. Like, what what are we doing? I will say, cause so you mentioned, uh, that's a good point, like with the par six. So like with a par three, obviously a tee shot matters. It's the one that's supposed to put you in regulation. Yeah. On a par four, it's the one that sets you up for your second shot to get in regulation. In a par mm-hmm. five, there's a chance it sets you up to get or the green eagle. Uh, yeah. yeah. On a par six, your tee shot means absolutely nothing. Your tee shot setting up your next tee shot. <laughs> right, your tee shot is just setting up uh, another tee shot, basically. That's what I'm saying. Let's just let's just play nine. That's a good holes. way to think about it. That's a good way to think about it. Is like a par six is the first par number that takes your tee shot really out of like scale. Like you're kind of like it's very detached from. Like obviously, it would matter, 
but you can't directly tie the next shot in to the final score as easily. A perfect hole is look at hole one at Emporia a couple weeks ago, right? Yeah. Very difficult if, if for anyone to get an eagle on that hole just because of the way the hole is set up. So if you throw a 350-foot shot off the tee or you throw a 450-foot shot off the tee, it doesn't really matter. The right. drive on that hole, as long as it's in bounds and not underneath the tree, doesn't really matter. And to me, that's not a well-designed hole. You want to make it to where if someone throws a good 475-foot shot off the tee, they have a massive advantage over the person that throws like a 400-foot shot. And on that hole, because the eagle is out of play, unless you're AB and you turn it over and you get a double skip off the road, um, it doesn't really make sense. So that's a, that's a way to kind of think about it and look at it. Same thing as that other par five. All Those the par kids. fives, out, out, yeah, all the par fives out there except for the last one are not e- eagleable. Kind of mm. interesting. Tough course, man. Tough course. Um, all right, going to move on to our next topic. More about the Copenhagen Open. Um, so. Copenhagen Open was the first of five full Pro Tour events taking place in Europe, uh, not including the major. Uh, the, the field was far weaker than normal, meaning that points were much easier to obtain for the normal touring pros, such as Paul Yulabari, that traveled. No shots at Yuli, but it's just the truth. Uh, what is your take on these European Pro Tours? Are they problematic? What is the Pro Tours angle with this move? Gary, you alluded that you had some things to say about this. So let's hear it. I think this event was fantastic and nowhere near the idea of problematic. Um, you know what I saw when I was watching this? I saw a beautiful course that had a very interesting design. Valby Park is the number one played course in the world, according to UDISC. 43,000 rounds recorded in 2023. It had a solid live coverage effort that could use a little bit of adjustments. An exceptional post-production crew with MDG. They had beautiful graphics. Their commentary was fantastic. And they great, it, the player and course insight was wonderful. Um, I saw a field of extremely young and hungry players. Um, Antu Tuominen, 16 years old. The dude has no major sponsors. He throws a lot of Innova plastic. Maybe they pick him up here. Um, wonderful playing from him. I saw an unbelievable final round You know, for Evelina coming back from an eight-stroke deficit to force a playoff. Insane. An unshakable um, Yesa Niminen being chased by five people and not caring as he canes birdie after birdie after birdie. I saw crowds of a ho- like hundreds of people. The tickets there were free. Yes, he said in his interview that he doesn't see these galleries in the United States. Mm. You know, if you watched it this weekend, if you didn't watch it because it was a weaker field, it was your loss. Um, I think that, uh, and I'll even challenge the weaker field argument. There were 48 players that over 1,000 rated at Copenhagen, only 31 at LBC. I think Copenhagen was a more competitive field because when you say far weaker, you just mean the stars weren't there, really. Um, I think the growth, of di- the growth of disc golf goes beyond our country. The mission statement of the Pro Tour doesn't say USA's largest tour. It says the world's largest tour. And um, the Australian tour was great. The European tour was great. Let's time dip for the United States people to get off their butts, learn some new names. Yes, and Eminen, uh, Etu Tillman, and Levi Stout. You get used to hearing these names. All right, Gary fired up for for Europe. Let's go! All right, Jake, what are you what are you thinking? I'm definitely fired up for Europe, but I'm going to come back at Gary and say it could have been a lot better if the Pro Tour played their cards right. Right? We had a split field, like we talked about. All the pros are back in the United States. Imagine that gallery and imagine that coverage with the full field there going up against the top European names. That's what I wanted to see as the Pro Tour heads into Europe. Now, since that they're adding all these events and since there's still events going on in the U.S., on the west coast of the U.S., mind you, which is as far away as you can get from Europe as possible without being in Hawaii, it's really hard for pros to get over there and compete in these, these events against these top European names. Now, it's absolutely, you're correct. It's great that they're getting on the map. It's great that they're getting on the radar. But I think what Americans want to see is they want to see, you know, their... Their top guys, their Ricky Wysockis, Calvins, Isaacs, they want to see them go up against the top European guys. And then, then they'll say, all right, these guys are for real. These guys are serious. These courses are beautiful. I want to see more from the European portion of the Pro Tour. That was my problem. I really wanted to see the Las Vegas Challenge uh, coverage, even post-produced, just because you know, I saw Connor Rock beat some of our top guys. Imagine if a European guy beat the top guys with all that coverage that was available. I think that would have done a lot for Europe, and I think it would have brought America and Europe a little bit more uh, together with this Pro Tour effort. Okay, yeah, fair points there from Jake. Um, Brody, what did you think? 
Well, I want to give a shout out to Yuli, my colleague, because let's be honest, if Yuli wasn't out there, no one in the United States would absolutely care about this past weekend. Um, <laughs> it's literally pretty easy to look at the difference in the coverage of what people were talking about last year when Paul Macbeth did his European tour kind of by himself. And this year so far, Paul goes out there big. Let's be honest, bigger name than Yuli. A lot more people are talking about it. This idea, I love it. Um, it's just not realistic. This idea of like, hey, we need to be paying attention to like other things. No, that's not how sports work. People like to pay attention to things that are the best. That's just the that's just it. The best players were not there. They were not. There was some. Some of the top 20 players there, a handful, maybe two, maybe three top 20 players in the world. After that, it got real nasty. You go out there. I don't, I don't know who else was out there. I just looked at the leaderboard. Um, and again, this is not a, you know, this is not a push towards um, or a slide towards European players. I think they have a place for sure. But this idea to tell like American people like, hey, you guys need to be paying attention to these European sports. Uh, that, that, that makes no sense. That's like going over to Europe and being like, Hey, these guys over in America, they know how to play soccer. You guys need to be staying up and watching American soccer. Cause they're pl- no, the best players in the world play soccer in Europe. That's what's watched. Not here in the States. That's just how sports work. Okay. Okay. A resounding response there. I'm sure we'll get back to that after Hunter. Yeah. Okay. Well, a lot of back and forth. I'm glad I'm the last year so I can just kind of put a bow on this whole thing because I am one of those Americans that watched this coverage and I did find it very entertaining, right? It was a beautiful course. There was a lot of great stuff and Gary brought up some great storylines, but here's the problem. Because of the Pro Tour scheduling, we don't know how good those storylines actually are. Um, the Also, far weaker for the field language. That's kind of harsh language, but the field was weaker based on stat Mando stats, not just based on ratings or something random. That's a stat Mando stat. Uh, I think the whole reason the pro tour is interested in this whole Europe thing is simply a control move. If I'm being completely honest, I think they saw the, you know, European disc golf pro tour kind of kicking up and they were like, Hey, that could become a problem for us. The disc golf pro tour, we need to take this over. And I think that's why the scheduling is kind of lackluster here, because what this really sucks for is Jesse Neiman and a lot of these players, because they really had Nicholas Antela and they had Paul Ulibarri to beat for us. American fans to kind of have any type of gauge had all the players been over there, right? Or at least like a B Calvin Gannon, Ricky and Jesse still won, which he very easily could have. Now that's a much bigger storyline and we have a much bigger grasp on how good this player is. Instead, we only have a few of his finishes here where he has a lot of ups and downs and we don't know what this guy's capable of. And there's nothing really to compare it to. In my opinion, what really needs to happen here that's good for the growth of the sport is all these European events need to be put together in a way that makes sense for the top guys from the U.S. to get over there, mingle with the European talent, so we can kind of see both ways how good these European players truly are. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Let's hear some butts. I mean, can't Hunter, can't we just look at his rating to see how good he played this past week? <laughs> I'm not even entertaining <laughs> no, that. No, that, 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 that course was nowhere near as difficult as some of the courses. Gary, I'm course. joking. Ray I know Brock. that. I know that. <laughs> Are you new here, Gary? That no, was sir. a joke. That was no, sarcastic. Sir. I'll tell you what, though, the number of forehand rollers you saw was very, very different than a normal Pro Tour event. That's I will sick. say, That's I, my I, disc golf. I, missed, yeah. I missed this in my main argument, but. I do think it's an important point. We didn't see the talent pool split in the MPO field, but we did see it in FPO, where we've seen a ton of top European talent leave the FPO field to go over for these random European events. And so now we're going to have, like we did, Missy Gannon, Haley King, Owen Scoggins, all battling with the absence of Kristen Tatar, Hannah Blomroos, Evelina Salonen. It's a worse product on both fronts, all because yep. of scheduling. Yeah, I yep. think that... Um... I don't remember who was it that mentioned it, but I think there is something to be said about the pro tour getting a little bit of cold feet, seeing the European disc golf scene be really big, seeing what's kind of bubbling over there and being like, we need to have our hands in both of these products so that we don't get overtaken. Cause like realistically your Europe has in historically gotten behind niche sports very heavily and, and bought, brought them to bigger stages than you can sometimes on us soil, just because of how dominant, you know, football's king here, football's right? So Basketball dominant. is, is big, you know, hockey, uh, baseball are also big, but football's king. And it, it really can drown out the niche sports and, and Europe can be a perfect place. And, and I think that the pro tour knows that and they're trying right now. It's like, they're just trying to equally, you know, 
put their eggs in two different baskets. Um, I'm curious what to know. What is the number two sport over there? They're like alpine skiing? <laughs> in no, Europe? Like, seriously, it might beyond be. Beyond soccer, you're saying? Yeah, like what is it? Is uh, it like it, there isn't really like a close number two, is there? Gosh, well, well like you're talking Europe not. or just in Europe, Europe. Like it's soccer, uh, and then it's got to be like a massive drop off to the next one, right? Europe. I mean, rugby. I mean, depends on the cricket, country. Right? Oh, rugby. Cycling. Oh, cricket. 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 Okay. Yeah, yeah, cricket would be cricket and rugby would probably be like your next two. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's not sleep on a uh, basketball too. On yeah, it's gonna a say. lot of the countries. Yeah. Basketball, like tennis, like tennis is super big. Boxing is big. Gary, can we can we Hand all agree? <laughs> can we all agree though that like this notion of telling people they need to tune into a product, like it's very hard to do that when it, the biggest stars aren't there. It's it's for me. It's not so much about uh, forcing people to tune in. What I what I what I've listened to over the past couple of days is too many podcasts and too many groups of people go to talk about the events this weekend and just put asterisks all over. Um, it's Yessa Niemann. I took time to try to understand that to just a, a little respect for his name, but I, I hate people going, well, I guess he can say he won something like to these guys. It's super passionate at the end of the broadcast when they but were are they wrong. No, listen, I, I agree that we need to get more people to, to watch disc golf and to do that. We need to get the big names over there. I'm going to spend a little less time judging it on what we all wished it could have been and what it was and how can we improve it to be better. I think next year we have to get more pros over there. But to sit back and say, well, this wasn't what it should be, so let's not even talk about it or let's just put a bunch of asterisks on it and talk about Las Vegas, I think is a wasted opportunity to discuss what worked really well and what didn't work well. And also... Barsby was there, and I know he didn't play the greatest, but Barsby is like a hero to a lot of the people over there. Um, you know, with the with the big win uh, he's had there, like the Sula Open. I, 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 think, know. I think the the problem is uh, it's it's a weird one because the like Yesse Niemannen to correct myself on his name, he did all he could do this weekend, right? He beat the field in front of him. He won a Pro mm -hmm. Tour event that can't be taken from him. But the Pro Tour is the one at fault for making you have all these questions because mm -hmm. what other professional sport do you have an event that's not like – imagine an NBA game happening, yet there's a pickup basketball game happening that has a bigger talent pool. Like that just would never well, – that doesn't make does, sense. It does happen in golf. It does happen in individual sports where they'll have like WGCs and they'll have some other stuff and they call them like their off week tournaments or like their B tournaments kind of thing. But everyone knows that. Like it's very clear when the top – when, you know, 38 of the top 40 players in the world are all playing one event – that's the event. The other one, if you win, that's a great story. It's awesome. And like, this is a great story for him. Um, what I find fascinating though, is like, you're not coming after, like, to me, I feel like you should have come after ratings super hard with Andrew Presnell. Like if you're so against people talking and putting an asterisk against his name for winning a tournament where there's no players, like that's kind of always my argument with ratings is because people are going to look at Andrew Presnell's rating of winning champions cup and not be impressed because it's rating was so low. Like, that's why I think like the ratings makes no sense. Get rid of it. Mm -hmm. But like they had, imagine, imagine if they just had a, they went back and had like a, a major event in Japan again. Like they did that one year, right? So many people right now, maybe it wouldn't be different because there is a lot of people that have the, the financial ability to do it. But there'd still be a lot of people that are really good disc golfers that would not be in that field. And to me, that's like the problem right now is like you have to put asterisks next to certain tournaments because that did not did that count as a disc golf pro tour win? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like to me, that is not equivalent to what's going to happen at OTB this next week. True. I understand that. But the success that they had with the field that they had. It's going to yeah, make it, fine. It, we're not, it's, we're not, it's, we're, no, 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 we're not I get that. That. I, I'm saying it's going to make it a lot easier for people to want to go there next year, especially if they can fix the scheduling issues to see, to, like if I'm a, an American, if I'm an American pro and I'm considering going, I'm not sure. And I see the crowds that were there and I see the course that they're playing. And I see some of the things that happen that, that Hey, the coverage is going to be pretty decent. I'm more inclined to make that journey over there because I saw that the stepping stones, the blocks were in place for that to be a great event. I can go yeah. back and say all the things I wish it could have been. I'm instead going to focus on what I, hap what I was happy that it was. No, uh, it it no does doubt. take, yeah, I was just going to say it does. It, it takes, it takes a lot for a lot of, again, if we go and look at golf, I think that's the best comparison. It takes a lot. And by a lot, I mean a major 
to get players to go from the United States to Europe to play an event. Or you have to be like John Rom and you have to be from Spain and you have to be like, Hey, I, I, this is, this is a meaningful course. Or you have to be someone that has played on the European tour, then come to the PGA tour. And that like a lot of these guys don't go to events over in Europe. And so this idea of like, it's a really cool course. It's got great fans, all that. The idea of flying to Europe to play an event to didn't fly back to the United States the next week, like that's not appealing to probably 90% of people on tour. It it has to be a swing. I think the best thing they can do is have, you know, two to three pro tours I'm okay with leading up to the European Open and just make that a part. And And then a couple after. And then, yeah, and then, yeah, maybe one or two after, whatever it is, maybe two on either side, whatever it is. Like, I think that makes sense. Um, cause yeah, cause there's no doubt. Yeah. The European, you know, European soil is a great place for disc golf. Their parks are on a different level. Yeah. That's um, never argued. Yeah. And, and yeah, the fans are awesome out there. If the players were there, they'd be sick of it. It's like, they would be so great. Well, the, uh, uh at my, one of my favorite all time favorite events every year is the European open because like the fans, Gary was right. There was a solid gallery out there. I mean, I don't think it was. It wasn't like USDGC or World Solid, but considering the field that was there, the gallery was crazy. Yeah. Imagine the gallery if you had all the top guys. And yep. I think that the US tour can learn a lot from Europe because pretty much every time it goes over there, the European tour monetizes in ways that aren't ticket sales. So what you get mm-hmm. instead is thousands and thousands and thousands of people there. And then they monetize the crowd they have there instead of being like nickel and diming, charging everyone 150 bucks to come to a tournament and then wondering why only 30 people showed up. I has think there's a lot that can be a, learned from that. Has everyone been to a disc golf pro tour event so far? Nope. Yep. Yeah. Trevor, you still haven't been to one yet? I've so been, been to, to majors. I've been to, oh, okay. yeah. I've been hmm. to, what, what do you guys think is like the actual value? Remove the disc golf. If the disc golf wasn't happening, what would be the actual value you would feel like being there? Parking, concessions, bathrooms, well, entertainment, music, entertainment all, all, outside of the at, disc at golf. At Music City, they they had all of the the value stuff for free to the public, and you were only paying to go watch the disc golf. So, like all the vending, concessions, mm-hmm. all of that stuff, you just walk up. I mean, I've paid a lot of money for stupider things, so... Sure, um, we all have. But I, I honestly, I could see myself, if it was an event I really liked, like, for instance, I've gone to Ledgestone a number of times. I mean, I've played, and then I've gotten spectated. I've also done the MVP thing. I'd gladly pay $100 to go out for a weekend. Yeah, and you're also on a podcast talking about disc golf. So you, we got we to gotta think, too... Like take yourself out of like the super fan and th- yeah. think about like how much would you pay if I said, Hey Gary, you know what? You really like watching bad sports. Uh, come down the street. Let's go watch some triple a baseball. We got one in town and you're like, Oh sweet. I'm like, all right, sweet. Uh, just Venmo me $150. Well, to are me, you go- are you doing that? Are you, well, are you going you there? You can't take the argument of fanship out of it because that, that, it, that is in there. Triple a baseball. I don't, Care as much about i'm willing to pay my my margin of like cost expenditure is going to be a lot lower i pay 25 bucks to go watch triple a baseball game just sure you know if it's going to be fun it's gonna be a good time we're going to the game that's great i know but, but I, the value that's what i'm saying the value of a triple a baseball game at 25 dollars is so much higher than what the disc golf ag- pro tour is giving us agreed that's but there's the also problem. there's also a thing is perceived value by a consumer consumers have perceived values based sure, upon yeah. their their how they feel things are. If if I feel like a restaurant has terrible food, my perceived value is it's a lot lower, even though they may charge a lot and I'll mm-hmm. avoid going there. If I think that I can go to an event, watch disc golf, but also get great food, not be terribly far away with parking, have a chance to meet some professionals and be in a spot where I can see good holes, my perceived value is a lot higher. I'm not going to a course where I can't see holes at, but if I can go to a course where I can walk around, I'll pay more to do that. The hardest thing with disc golf is because it is such a niche sport, you have this very big separation be- between the disc golf fan and the person who would go watch a disc golf event not knowing much about disc golf. Because the mm-hmm. disc golf fan is would pay a very high price, and they and yes. some of them are. Um, but the amount that the the other person you're targeting would pay because there's not really a ton of casual disc golf fans out there. We know this. Most of them are are fan. If they're if they're gonna follow the tour, they follow it pretty well. And the mar- the amount that 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 person doesn't really know much about anything about disc golf at all would pay is like next to nothing. Five bucks, ten bucks maybe. So there's that disparity between them, and that's what makes this difficult. And it, it I, makes the I, European I, thing interesting. 
Like I would love to see like some promo where it's like a buy one, get one free. Like bring, bring your disc golf buddy with you. Right. Because yeah. I bet there's a lot of people that play disc golf with one another. Hey, the disc golf pro tour is coming to town. I, come out with us. Come out with me guys. It's going to be fun. And they're like, okay, sweet. How much are tickets? $40. Oh, heck no. I'm not doing that. Yeah. Right. Like there are so many people that play disc golf that would actually go out and enjoy it. It's just that money. I think it, that that cost is pushing a lot of people yeah. away, and especially when you get there and see what value you're getting for your money. Yeah, it's well, yeah, there, tough. There's it's over tough. a million people that play disc golf every well, I think year, the, and, the, and there's really, not that many watching it. The really the yeah, because I, I think that buy one get one idea is genius, Brody. I think that you need to be texting Jeff Springs that mm. because for I went to Music City, right, and my whole point of going was to hang out with one of my best friends who lives in Nashville. When before I went, I just bought his ticket to the Music City Open because there was no chance I was texting no, him, yeah. yo, you got to pay 40 bucks or whatever it was to come watch this sport you don't really care about. But he was really interested in coming with me because he was like, this is going to be a fun thing. We can go watch this sport. But I was not going to make him pay 40 bucks to come watch this. But if it was buy one, get one free, there's not really a cost to the Pro Tour of having feet on the ground per se, if that makes sense. Um, there will be people that take advantage of this, right? Like there will be people who like, oh, me and Trevor are going regardless. And now I can buy and bring Trevor free. But uh, what I think the Pro Tour can do here is instead of having to go the full risk marketing thing of we're going to lower it to five bucks from 40 or whatever the average cost is, we're going to lower it to five bucks and hope that we're selling eight to one tickets. Well, instead we can just make it buy one, get one free. And if people take advantage of it, we lose a little bit of money, but hopefully instead of 500 people being there, there's 750 people there. And yeah, now yeah. those extra 250, we're making way more money on vending and concessions and all that stuff. And I like that model growing, a lot, but I think the, the European, they, they've got some stuff figured out up there. Yeah, yep. it, yeah. it's yeah. definitely yeah. Be... Well, because the, the crowds, and the, the, average, the average pro tour crowd over here, it, it leaves a lot to be desired. I'm I'm almost 95% of the time I'm disappointed when they pan to the crowd. And the I'm like, you gotta have, be kidding me. That's yeah. all we drew to this pro tour event. The galleries have not been super, super impressive this year at all. Um, curious to see some of the bigger events. I mean, I feel like you know, some of the big events like USDGC have continued to kind of pick up steam because um, they build a reputation, but other events are definitely struggling. We're gonna move on. Um, a lot of interesting things to discuss with that. Um, in the future, but we're going to move on to our last topic. This is fan submitted. I think this one is, uh, was an interesting one. This actually was submitted uh, via email. Um, so this person said, Brody often talks about attracting real in quotes, uh, athletes to the sport, as opposed to guys and women we already have on tour. Are these real quotes athletes a thing, or do you think players on tour already display our human potential in disc golf case in point, regular golfers on average look way less conventionally athletic than disc golfers. In other words, it's not like regular golf has changed in any way by attracting these hypothetical real athletes. I didn't say those words. Wait, are they just so I know the question, are they saying that golf, are they, did they say that golfers look less athletic than disc golfers? That's one thing they said. Don't try not to pay too much attention to that part of the question. I think don't, the more, don't the more, I think the more interesting part of the question is the idea that maybe we've already seen uh, a lot of the human potential in disc golf and having these oh. like super athletes isn't going to push it that much further. I think that's more the, the other okay. part. Yeah, that was that was a pretty hot take. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say just literally stick Rory McIlroy next to anyone. And tell me which <laughs> tell me which one looks more athletic. Um, all right. Uh, Jake, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I've been trying to ignore the way the question was worded. You know, when we talk about real athletes, we just talked about this earlier. You know, are we going to attract athletes away from basketball, baseball, football? Probably not. And that's not what disc golf is here for. Disc golf is here for the people. Disc golf is a people sport. And I think that's what we need to do is just focus on growing the sport. Um, the athletes will find their way in. If they're really good, they'll make it to the pro tour. They'll see that potential in tournaments and leagues that they play. Uh, but I don't think we're at the Liberty to just try to attract the real top level athletes into our sport. Um, right now it's great to go out. You can go out with friends, family, and it's pretty much like hiking with an activity for some people. And that's what it should be in order to grow the sport more. Um, eventually people are going to start trickling their way into leagues, into tournaments and the I don't know, quote unquote, real athletes, they'll find their way into the tournaments and they'll start winning and they'll start to chase that pro tour. Um, but we look at the pro tour right now and a lot of those folks that are uh, performing at the top of their game, 
they probably wouldn't do well in any other sport. I'm just going to say it there. I mean, they're long, they're lanky, and they can throw the disc 80 miles an hour. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah, there, there is definitely a type at the top of the pro tour at the moment. Um, all right, uh, Brody, what do you think about this? Since it was yeah, kind I mean, of directed to you. That was that was an interesting. I, I kind of always want to hear what uh, Gary and Hunter say about this. But yeah, I'm going to go just off of what Jake had to say, because that was an interesting answer. He, this this disc golf is here for the people. I have no idea what that means. You should definitely get into politics because that seems like a slogan <laughs> that some pol- politician uh, would say. That makes no sense. What is everything's here for the people? What, what does that even mean? Um, other thing is is like yeah, if I go to Cracker Barrel and they have that little peg game, right? That peg game is really fun, right? I I like playing that peg game when I go to Cracker Barrel. When I go on a vacation with my family to the mountains, hiking. Hiking is really fun, but if all of a sudden that peg game at Cracker Barrel was like, Hey, we're going to run a tournament. The winner that can solve the peg game at Cracker Barrel, the fastest gets a million dollars. Does that change the entire environment of the peg game at Cracker Barrel? Absolutely. Absolutely does. Same thing with hiking. If hiking all of a sudden started having hiking competitions. Now, no one really cares about hiking. It's not very interesting. It's not really exciting. So that's why we don't see that same thing with the peg game. We're not going to see a million dollar tournaments because it's not very exciting. Disc golf is exciting. There is potential for it to be exciting and to get these real athletes in, you need money. That's just all it is. If all of a sudden someone was like, Hey, I can't make it in this top four sport, but I can play disc golf and still be a millionaire. I'm going to do that. Okay. Right, well, I mean, can I rebuke since it was built off yes. my argument then? Sure. I sure. will allow it. <laughs> what I mean by for the people, I mean <laughs> what? anyone can walk onto a disc golf and play disc golf course and play. I'm not going to walk into a baseball field tomorrow and, and casually play. Yes, and, you and can, the, Jake. No, you can't. No, I can't. I can't compete. I don't have that coordination. It's going to take me a while to get wait, better. Wait, I have to what, find what are you other saying? people. You can't just find a bunch of your buddies to go play baseball. What was your? What were you saying about disc golf? Need a lot of buddies to play disc baseball. Golf, I can walk out there and play by myself, no problem. With a golf oh, course, I, I think what okay. Jake was saying. If you're I think saying it's a, like, it's a, it's an activity that you can do accessible. by yourself. It's the funnel, accessible. It's yeah. for the people. People can go out and just do right. it. They don't have to look for a team. They don't have to pay for anything. In in most cases, other it's than not the a disc. team sport, it's for you're the you people. Don't need it. Yeah. I, I, Jake's trying to say that the funnel for disc golf is wide because of his accessibility. You could funnel in. Uh, people to the more competitive side of the sport through the casual side of the sport. And I agree with that. I think that, yeah, but I mean, that's also a that. terrible take. That, that's like saying guys, Hey, drawing is super accessible. Anyone can draw. It's going to blow up. We're going to make a sport. It could yeah, be, can, why couldn't it be a sport? All right. And look, I can do it for recreation or I can sell my art if I get really good at it. Same right, with this. We should guy. be attracting the recreational people. Um, all right. <laughs> I didn't mute him. Why did I hear him? It didn't mute work. Button didn't work. <laughs> mute button didn't work. It's a mutiny. Oh my Dang god! It. It mu- it, we have no I control. It muted him in the uh, in final post, but I heard him in our call. Um, in any case, uh, all right, Hunter, what do you think about real athletes? Do we have them? Are they real? Okay. Yes. Well, uh, first off, I gotta attack the hiking thing. There, you, there's a thing called trail running. It's competitive hiking. It's electric. Uh, real athletes do it. Uh, anyways, I also have to attack <laughs> this question because people can't just submit questions we pick for the show and then just get off scotch-free. This question's based on two completely false premises, which is just crazy. First, that regular golfers look less athletic than disc golfers. Wild take. Wild take. I, don't, I just Google professional golfer, scroll for a little bit, you're done. Secondly, that disc golfers Tapper aren't is. real athletes. That's also the second take that it was kind of pulled from. Uh, not really good either there. Anyway, let's get into the meat and potatoes of this question, okay? Disc golfers are athletes, but there are a lot more athletic people out there. I don't think anyone would disagree with that take, right, than the current crop of disc golf talent. But I don't think athleticism is going to come in and all of a sudden people are going to be throwing 850 just because they're more athletic. Instead, I think it's going to increase the consistency of the top performance. I think that's where the athleticism comes in. So the top of the field, would it really change? AB is going to be able to compete with most people on the face of the planet, I think. Same thing with Calvin and Gannon. I think what it really would change is the depth of the field. And the more athletes that come in, the higher the 
game's going to get pushed. To think that anyone's done any sport at the highest level that we'll ever see is just wrong. Crazy. Every sport's going to continue to grow and continue to get faster, um, better and better. And disc golf is no exception to that, especially at the rate we're growing. Um, but here's another thing that I do think we have to consider as we look at our current crop of disc golfers. Does our sport actually require athleticism? Maybe that's a different angle. Big question. It's the big question on everybody's mind. <laughs> I'm thinking I love about. watching. I love watching Hunter's mouth move, and then the words come out. Yep. <laughs> Three seconds. <laughs> it's like, I knew for, I knew he's, for, he's like something to think about. It's like, <laughs> think about. Oh my gosh! All right, Gary, wrap it up for us. What do you think? <laughs> I think I think what's really interesting about disc golf is that we don't truly know what perfect form looks like, and we don't have what a perfect athlete for disc golf is. We have some ideas based upon the people that are currently in the sport. You look at things like having a large ape index, explosive muscles, and guys with like the long, wide strides to create power. There's some outliers, though. I mean, look at guys like Emerson Keith. No shot to short people, but he generates some serious power with his frame. Um, I think over time, we've definitely seen the athleticism increase within the sport. And there's also been a significant push in treating players as athletes, which is a big deal, too, with like apparel and uh, performance equipment and getting the trainers and physical therapy. I think that's a big deal. And there are some pros now who are when you think about like peak athletes, you think about people like Gavin Babcock, who might be one of the most physically imposing disc golfers just with his wrestling experience. Um, you got Ezra Aderhold who's built like a brick house. Luke Sanson and Albert Tom are two of the biggest people I've ever seen. And you got Brody Smith when his knees feel good. So like you've got some serious athletes out there in the field. And, but the thing is, is just because they're more athletic than other players, I think it doesn't always equate to better results because golf, when you talk about golf, the, the impetus for this question is a game that requires athleticism, intelligence, and efficiency. You, know, you need to be able to be consistent with your, your club swing. You need to understand changing conditions to be really in tune with your body. And disc golf is a lot like that, you know, because it has all those components, but I think there's a touch more athleticism involved because there's movement involved. But as the game progresses, I think players are going to figure that out. Athleticism is going to uh, move to greater endurance to keep players consistent, focus on recovery with age. And in five to 10 years, we're going to find out that Zach Melton was the peak of human potential this whole time. <laughs> I think when it comes to athleticism and disc golf, Couldn't agree um, more. it relates a lot more to the speed in which you get good at disc golf. Like an athlete will have a bet, a much easier time improving at disc golf. But in this game, practice you know can overcome a lot of things and you can have guys who are less athletes but have just played so much disc golf that you know yes arm strength you can absolutely attribute because like there are major league baseball pitchers who are not insane athletes but they've worked really hard at their craft they have really gifted arm strength and that's what's got them there um you see this in every sport you see guys who maybe not you know well, there's a reason where... There's That's reason in the NBA athleticism because everyone yeah. has different, everyone has a different uh, opinion on what athleticism actually is. Well, so that's why, like when you say athlete, right? Like you don't, you can kind of remove yourself a little bit from the athleticism because there are athletes that are playing in other sports that are really freaking good. Yeah. Then like to me, again, it's a Conor McGregor is a perfect example of that. Right. I think we would all look at him and be like, he is a really good athlete. But right. all you need to do is watch him shoot a basketball. If yeah. that's all you saw him do, he was wearing normal clothes and you watched him saw, shoot a basketball, you would look at that person and be like, gosh, that guy's super unathletic. Right. Like that's the, what you would go in your brain. Well, but there's of, so much more to it. Than think just about that. it this way in the NBA, there's so few roster spots in the NBA, right? Like those are the elite of the elite basketball players in the world. And yet, yes. if you watch draft prep shows, they will use athleticism as a metric. Even in the most with the top, top athletes that play the game of basketball, they 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 will say some guys, you are a really good athlete or you're not not the best athlete, but a good basketball player. Like that's what you're dealing with is it doesn't always just translate to skill in a sport. I think people yes. just people love that fan fiction idea of like, what if LeBron James played soccer? It's the same thing with disc golf. They're like, oh, my gosh, could you imagine if, uh, you know, all these players imagine were, <laughs> Victor Wimbanyama or Giannis Antetokounmpo. Right. Right. Exactly. I mean, imagine, imagine that's when he, instant. Yeah. That's where, that's where like the athleticism, there are people in a bunch of sports that you can look at the nut. Cause to me, athleticism is a lot of like the numbers stuff, like yeah. how fast you are, how, uh, how strong you are, how high you can jump that. And then you have other stuff of like, do you have good hand eye coordination? Can yeah. you actually catch a, catch a ball? Can you throw a ball? Can you? And then the other one that you were saying too, is like, to me, a real athlete is going to be able to put themselves in a sport and get astronomically better at that sport in a very faster window with mm -hmm. the same amount of practice as a non-athlete. Right. 
that's just that yeah, to me that, i think that's the easiest way of looking at it definitely yeah it definitely gets over exaggerated sometimes and people think about the future of disc golf because yes there are certainly more athletes will improve the sport quicker absolutely but like at the end of the day yeah, you can take the most athletic guy you can think of, and it's going to be a long, long time before they can get as good as a Gannon Burr at disc golf. Like that's just that's just the reality of the situation. Yeah. The interesting uh, thing would be is if those people decide to play disc golf because the money isn't as crazy of a, uh, a a difference, right? Like there are a lot of people that go into golf at a young age because you can make a, a whole lot of money more money and actually you don't have to have like CTA for the rest of your, like there's a lot of advantages of being a golfer than being a basketball player or being a football player disc golf. If they can get those advantages closer, now you can actually have people maybe making decisions of like, Hey, I actually want to do disc golf and not golf or disc yeah. golf and not, you know, football. Certainly. Certainly. But where does that money come from? You're the up. people. It's for the people. The people. We're yeah. here for the people. <laughs> yeah, you got it. <laughs> all right, all right. We're going to move on to the finals. Move on to the finals. Uh, He's a man of close the people. one today. I'll play baseball Hunter, with you, Jake. Hunter versus Gary. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, Hunter, Hunter uh, plus 10 seconds, and Gary in the finals. Fun transition. <laughs> oh, What's man. crazy his, to me is, y'all, is there is no delay. Like, there it is, is no delay. It's so bad. <laughs> It's so bad. Like I can see y'all's lips moving instantly. I'm responding instantly. Well, this and your program hates me. To your credit, Hunter, I haven't noticed this in a long time on this show. I really haven't. Um, but the crazy thing is, this okay. program. I, this I got program wired in internet. I pay for five hundred, five hundred down. I don't understand what I'm supposed to do. I have faster internet than we have at Foundation, and I'm wired into it, and I can't freaking see but two pixels. Hunter, the crit. The crazy thing is, is y'all are still waiting for me to finish talking. <laughs> the crazy, the crazy thing is, is I feel like I'm really good on this program. But then he when needs we a new to, computer, man. It's a computer. It's the only when thing. When we left. go to tour life in an hour and a half, I'm terrible. It on killed tour life. my last computer. All right, all right. I was just trying There's to take it down from the inside. Files down. Trying to take it down. Connection. Yeah, it's you and Brody. That's right. Whatever sure. happened to that new program we were getting? Um, <laughs> uh, it doesn't do something, Sal said. It doesn't work. Um, anyways, final topic. Neither does Every this one. I'll make go second. Hunter, take Hunter's <laughs> video off. I know, dude. Make, Hunter's, make Hunter just audio. I make can't Hunter, hear uh, make Hunter like uh, a, a me from the Wii U universe. Yeah, That's exactly. what he can be. Just give him um, a little emoji. One of those hand emojis or whatever. <laughs> Just have Brody mouth all of his words yeah, as he's saying. That Brody pantomime Hunter's argument. Oh, there we go. I can yeah. do that. Okay. Um, <laughs> final topic here. This one, it, we're a little late to the to the show, but I feel like we need to talk about it on debate night. So, Colbert Allen made headlines last week due to his early exit at DDO, citing the wait for the FPO playoff not being worth it since he was out of contention significantly. Um, you know, that's a whole topic in, in itself. I want to talk about this. Is it, is this a finable offense and where should the DGPT draw the line when it relates to ambiguous situations like this one and their power to hand out fines? That's what I'm really interested to know. Um, let's see. I'll let Gary go. Gary, do you want to go first or second? Cause I can actually respond to you in real time. I'll go first because uh, Hunt, I'm I'm basically battling Hunter's internet. It's like a one v two right now, and so it's kind of not fair. That's true. Okay. Um. All right, Gary, go for it. All right, first and foremost, I think this was certainly a bad look for Cole. Um. You know, when I think of players from last year coming out of the season that I was the most excited to watch play this year, Cole Cole Redallin was certainly on the top of that list. Um. And uh, I don't think this disqualifies him for me and for a lot of people. I think it just shows that he's not emotionally ready for some of that growth quite yet. And as a as a professional player who's sponsored by large companies, I think there is a certain level of decorum expected when it comes to your behavior on the course. Speaking in relation to this DNF specifically, he wasn't sick. He wasn't injured. He filmed it. And I think we can all agree that the reason he had to wait was extremely unfortunate. But if you want to just step away, I guess do it. Don't film it. Don't write some half-hearted apology justifying your behavior. And don't do that obnoxious salute. like. Do I think that he should be fined for this? I don't know that I want the Pro Tour having to come up with some system for fines right now. It's got enough things to figure out. Um, I also don't think the court of public opinion is enough because half of the fans seem to not care too much about this. The right thing might be a suspension from the next event. That will hit him in the pockets. It, it could be more effective. So maybe an event suspension um, could be useful here. I think um, some of this is also indicative of how culture is changing a bit in the sport of disc golf. 
you know, look at um, I, I love watching their stuff, but look at Alden Harris, Gavin Babcock, and the Robinson brothers. They're pelting each other with ice cream the nights before events. Um, could you imagine Paul or Ricky doing something like that or or doing what Cole did? I mean, there's professionalism from the moment an event starts to the moment of the event finishes. So I think that a firm stance from the pro tour um, could be a great reminder of what uh, being a professional player is all about. Do I think that should be in the shape of a fine? No, I think you can accomplish the same thing with a suspension. It's basically a fine. It keeps you from being able to win stuff. It's kind of a black mark for your sponsor. It's a black mark for you as a player, but it also doesn't do so much to like hinder too much because he can go, he can spend some time with his thoughts and, and recoup and come back to the next one. It's like uh, one of the top responses on his post on Instagram was was Nate Sexton saying, just just learn from this one, bud, and move on. Okay. Okay. Good thoughts there from Gary. Um, all right, Hunter. Fire away. Ready at will. Oh, yes. my gosh. <laughs> all right. I'm going to do everyone a favor and turn my camera off here. Um, okay. So here's the first <laughs> Don't thing. Have to, I do brother. think this should be punishable in some way, shape, or form. Uh, but – fine suspension some type of penalty but what i really think the problem here is like the pro tour if if cole Radalin had just walked off and he not posted this like it wouldn't have there is no we don't know how many players are doing this i guess is the point i'm trying to say like we don't know how many players are saying oh i have arthritis in my hand or whatever and just walk off the course and they're actually completely fine they just don't want to wait any longer right so it's way too ambiguous because had cole not been so honest which is now in this case a flaw for him, we wouldn't have known. So I think the true solve for this actually comes in a different form, which is just to have cuts. Because let's be real here, okay? A lot of players have felt exactly what Cole is feeling, where these upcoming holes, pointless. This final round, meaningless. This shot I'm about to throw, meaningless. Why am I having to throw it? The real reason he's having to throw it is because there wasn't a cut. The last three holes were pointless for a lot of the field. The whole final round was pointless, but on the Pro Tour, if there was a cut, this would also help with pace of play. The FPO playoff probably could have happened before anyone ever even got to hole 16. There wouldn't have been this whole 45-minute wait. And the bottom of the field, like Brody's brought up multiple times, they don't really want to play the final round anyways. We aren't really in an era of people playing on the Pro Tour just for the experience of playing on the Pro Tour anymore. So we need to get rid of these rules and quote-unquote normal practices that were in place with that frame of mind where it was all based on Oh, but so and so's traveling from wherever to play Ledgestone, and we got to give them four rounds of disc golf because that's what they're coming for. No, they're a professional disc golfer. If they're 75 strokes back going into a round at Northwood Black, do you really think they want to be out there? No. Let them go ahead for logistical and practical reasons to use Cole Rodolin's exact words, move on, and just say, hey, bud, you ain't even got to show up. Don't worry about it. So, finable, I don't know. I don't think that there's a completely different fix to this that we should really be focusing on. I like that point, Big Hunt. I like that. And, you know, I really like that nose you've got too. So mm -hmm. I'm going to, I actually, I like that point a lot. I think that um, having the cut, keeping the bottom of the field fighting for cash is a very good solution. And I like that angle. So I'm going to give you the win today, uh, Mr. Me. You know, I, I am proud to be the first me <laughs> to have won. Uh, I think it's big for me's going forward. And people like me, um, I think that this is a, a big moment in the sport and in the podcast and, you know, just, just honored to have done it and, um, can't wait to figure out my Wi-Fi and take 552 of this show that maybe I can be back normal next time. Yeah. Hunter is the man. Hunter is a man of the meeple. I'm a man of the meeple. The yep, sport meeple. by the meeple for the we meeple. Need, we need to get another shirt already. Right. And we are better my because God. he's here. That's right. <laughs> um, listen, if you want to submit topics that get absolutely dissected on this show. Um, give us your hottest takes QR code here on the screen. You can scan that, submit a topic, or you can click the link in the description. Listen, throw them all at the wall. Just whatever you want to hear us talk about, just chuck them in there. Um, I love putting them in there. It's, it's, it's more fun that way. Also, don't forget about that man of the people shirt. Uh, if you made it to the end of this episode, then you're a real big fan of the show and we want you to pick one up. Um, or if you don't like Brody, maybe we need to get a man of the people, uh, Meeple. Yeah, meeple. Man of the Meeple shirt. <laughs> Man um, of the Meeple. <laughs> but uh, you can check that out at foundationdisc.com. We will see you next week with another episode.